Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's nice to see everybody with us this morning. Happy first day of March. I don't know about anyone else, but it seems like February just really flew by for me, even with the extra day that we had yesterday. It's hard to believe it's March already. Anyone else been enjoying the snow? Anyone else like just really pumped that we had an awesome, at least one more snowstorm? Yeah. Anyone else is just like, come on, give me spring already? A couple of you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jason. <laughs> so last week we got to see and hear from Mike about his trip to Zambia. <clears throat> and that was really awesome just to get to, to hear the stories, get to learn a little bit about their culture, how we can be praying for them. And Mike even, he came up with, not just the 12 that um, I challenged, but 26 things, wasn't it 26, I think, uh, that he had learned from the trip, so that was great. And it's just cool to see what God is doing and how he's working throughout the world. Um, and I'm just reminded of that fact that God's church is not just North Country Fellowship Church, is it? It's the whole family of God throughout the whole earth, and a lot of other, those families are gathered like we are this morning um, some in much larger numbers, but many in much smaller numbers and in smaller spaces, and some even in, in secret. But ultimately, all of us local churches are part of God's global church. And that's just one of my favorite reminders uh, or takeaways from global trips like, like Mike took, is to see God working uh, throughout the world. And that would be a great topic to preach on, but it's not, not our topic for today. So we're going to return, obviously, to the life of David we've been going through and, of course, that's King David, just to clarify again, not of the Old Testament, not me. <clears throat> and we've, we've spent a total of four weeks so far uh, just looking at the narrative of his life. And it's going to take probably one more week at least to wrap the story up, but we're getting towards the end. If you missed any of the previous messages on the life of David, you can uh, catch up on those if you'd like to, all um, online on our website. So we're going to dive in, but I'm going to start with just a quick recap of the things that we've covered so far. Obviously, we haven't unpacked every single detail of the story of David. That would take a lot more than a few weeks, but we did try to hit just kind of the major themes and events uh, that, that happened in the story. So to set the story up, we started in the book of Samuel, <clears throat> after kind of we covered Samuel's story. And then we had this preface of the three themes that we pulled out of Hannah's uh, poem. Samuel's mother, Hannah, wrote this poetic prayer um, in, in gratitude towards God. And in it, we <clears throat> pull out three themes. The first was that God opposes the proud, but exalts the humble. The second is that God is at work in, in moving his mission forward despite human depravity and evil and, and terrible mistakes that people make. And then finally, the third was that promise that God would provide a Messiah, a Savior King for Israel. And so those three points, they're not the only lessons, obviously, that we can get from uh, the book, uh, but they are, they're major themes, and I've found it to be a helpful framework in understanding the, the point of the story in all of its different pieces and as a whole. So then we looked at David's anointing and how he was chosen by God, <clears throat> anointed by Samuel, to replace Saul and his family as king over Israel, even though David was the last person anyone would have expected God to use or choose. And then we read about how David, with really pure motives um, and, and a humble spirit, defeated the giant Goliath against seemingly impossible odds, and it was because Yahweh was on his side. And David knew that, he believed it, and he totally gave credit to God for that victory. So we saw through all of that David's great faith and his humility. Even as he continued to be incredibly successful, he got married to uh, the king's daughter. He became really famous and really just loved throughout all of Israel. But through that, so far in the story, he has stayed humble and respectful. Uh, even as Saul turned against him and started trying to kill him, and Saul himself kind of descended into madness and self-destruction as he declined. And ultimately, his decline led to a violent end for him. But David, when Saul died, instead of celebrating that his 
enemy, this guy who's been trying to kill him, has died. He mourned the death of his king. And he, I didn't, we didn't talk about this, but he actually wrote a funeral song for Saul and commanded that all the people memorize this song in honor of Saul and Jonathan. That's pretty cool. So then David became king, and a couple weeks ago, Mike brought us through the story in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel of how David ultimately brought the Ark of the Covenant back uh, or to Jerusalem. And that was just extremely significant because it meant that God's presence would abide with them among the people, and it was just this cause for immense joy and, and celebration. And that's where we left off in the story in chapter 6. So we're going to pick it up uh, back in chapter 7. If you want to turn there to 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is a really significant chapter because, and not just for this book, but for the whole Bible, because it describes what we refer to as the Davidic covenant. So it's a covenant between God and David. And we're going to take a little bit more of a look into what that means uh, to be a covenant in a minute. But first, let's just read through the beginning of this chapter together. We're going to start in verse 1, chapter 7, 2 Samuel. When King David was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, Why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Now, go and say to my servant David, This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies has declared. I, take you from tending, I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now, I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. And I will provide a homeland for my people, Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past, starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple, for my name. And I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with a rod like any father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time. And your throne will be secure forever. So Nathan went back to David and told him everything the Lord had said in this vision. So this whole passage starts off with David basically saying, hey, there's something wrong with this picture, the fact that I'm living in this beautiful palace made of cedar while God is in this lousy tent. And this is, again, I think just a glimpse into David's humble heart. I think his desire to, to put God before himself and to... He, he, his, David's own palace is a symbol of his strength and leadership, and he wanted to elevate God in front of him and to have... He didn't want to have more honor than God. And I think that's just a really good motive, and that desire came from a really noble place in David's heart. So he expressed this to Nathan, a prophet of God, who he then just says, okay, yeah, do whatever you have in mind. God is with you. So he's essentially speaking on God's behalf without really consulting God, as far as we can tell, uh, before saying that. And it becomes clear in the next verse that he didn't, because then God does speak to Nathan. And he is certainly quick to correct himself and doesn't hesitate to go and, and tell David the correct message, so I'll give him that. But um, the, the message was basically, thanks, but no thanks. In fact, I'm going to build you a house and make your house 
even greater. So I'm sure that came as a surprise to both Nathan and David. Now eventually God will allow a more permanent temple to be built, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. For now we're going to shift our focus over to the, the, those next eight verses, so 8 through 16. And this is the section that we call the, the covenant, the Davidic covenant. But before we unpack this covenant, I do want to just take a quick step back and, and look at that idea of covenants and what they are. So a covenant is a promise, it's a commitment, and it's a partnership. Now we don't really use that term covenant very often in our day-to-day conversation, uh, but the one place where I thought of where we might actually use it is in when referring to a marriage as a covenant, a marriage covenant. So marriage is a promise, and that's why we say vows at a wedding. It's a commitment, it's a partnership. So I think marriage is just a really good example, a a helpful way to understand the significance of what a covenant is. And even God will refer often to his people as being in a covenant, uh, marriage covenant relationship with them, using that analogy of of a bride and groom to describe his love and his commitment to his people and the commitment that he expects back. Now, the, the, the Davidic covenant here is not the first covenant that we've seen in God's story. Is it? We've actually covered them here, a few others. So I just want to review those quickly. Now, first of all, some would say that God had a covenant with, with Adam and Eve in the garden, which they then violated, and that that broke their, their partnership with, with God. But that's more of an implied covenant. It's not spelled out specifically. So aside from Adam and Eve... Who can tell me what the first covenant is in the Bible, or with whom the first covenant is? Noah. Yep. I know you know. (laughs) Yeah, I uh, heard it from a lot of people. So that first one is found in the story of Noah, so we call it the Noahic covenant. Uh, It was a promise that God made to Noah, but really to all of humanity, that he would never again wipe out the whole earth like he did in Noah's day. And this was actually a totally unconditional promise. It didn't require anything from humans in return. So no matter how much humans messed up, God was still going to keep this promise. And in fact, what God essentially said was, because people, mankind is just so wicked and always will be, I'm promising I won't hit that reset button again. So then, what's the next, the next guy who God makes a covenant with? Abraham. Yep. So th- and this one we've actually talked quite a bit about because we went through Abraham's story. So God's covenant with Abraham, or the Abrahamic covenant, was a promise to make Abraham's name great and to bless the whole world through his family, his descendants. Now this covenant still didn't really require a whole lot of work on Adam's part to make that happen. However, we do see throughout the story that God did require Abraham to have faith, and to trust God to lead him. And ultimately, Abraham did pass that test of faith. Though he did mess up in some other ways, he failed to trust God at times, but God still considered Abraham's faith as enough to uphold his end of that that partnership. So then many generations of Abraham's family go by, and they become a large people group, and eventually we find the third covenant in the story of who? Moses. Yes, so... We call that the Mosaic Covenant, and I just want to clarify that it's the Mosaic Covenant because of Moses, and it doesn't have anything to do with arranging colorful tiles to make a design, a picture, just to hear Mosaic. It's it's Moses, not that. And it's really, again, it's a covenant with all of the people of Israel, all of Abraham's descendants, and it was given through Moses. And this covenant actually came with a very specific set of laws, of expectations, which God asked the people to follow. And they're, they're guidelines for living in a relationship with God and with each other. And it would help them be a healthy and loving community centered around their faith and their worship of Yahweh and his presence and his leadership among the people. So then the people of Israel, of course, agreed to follow those guidelines and to enter that partnership with God. And in that partnership, God would then bless them and and multiply them, protect them, and they would become a people who represent God to the rest of humanity. And of course, as we all know, they did not do a great job of following that law. 
But that brings us <clears throat> finally to the last divine covenant in the Old Testament, uh, back to this covenant with King David. So I'm just going to read through this covenant one more time in verses 8 through 16. Now go and say to my servant David, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. And I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past, starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father, he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with a rod like any father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, who I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. Now, there are some elements to this promise that are not really at all dependent on David's or his family's, his descendants' cooperation. It's just going to happen. Uh, But we also see throughout the rest of the story that God is really asking to partner with David and his descendants to lead Israel in obeying the laws and becoming a kingdom that is representative of God in truth and in love and in justice and beauty. But here's the thing, and I'm going to get a little bit ahead in this story, but Israel did not turn out to be a very good partner. And they just repeatedly broke the covenant that they agreed to with Moses. They worshipped other gods. They allowed horrible injustices. And they ended up losing their land. They got forced into exile, and they lost their right to participate in God's blessings. And it was during that time when certain prophets of God started to talk about a time in the future when God would somehow restore these covenants, despite Israel's failures. And there's this idea, this hope, that became known as the hope for a new covenant, something that would somehow fix the mess of all the the broken ones. And they didn't know exactly how that would be possible or what it would look like, but it was attached to this promise that we've talked about of a Messiah a chosen one who would become king and unite Israel again, making them great again under this so-called new covenant. And around Christmas time, we, take, we took some time to look at a few of the, the messianic prophecies, the prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament. And we talked about how when Jesus is introduced in the New Testament, it's as someone who fulfills all of those prophecies. And because of that, He also fulfills all of these covenants that we've just talked about, though not quite in the way Israel was expecting him to. So he was from the the family of Abraham. So he carried with that the Abrahamic covenant, but he came to fully realize that covenant by actually extending those blessings of Abraham's family to the whole world, which was part of that original promise. And then he was the first and only Israelite, or human for that matter, to fully, faithfully, and perfectly obey the law that was given through Moses. So he fulfilled that as well. And he claimed to be the king that was promised to come from the line of David. And he did come from the line of David. So there are a few different layers to this Davidic covenant. And this is common for prophetic statements in the Bible, where it will apply to some things in the short term and in the long term, kind of simultaneously. So do you notice that God does bring back up that topic of building him a house or a temple? In verses 12 and 13, he says that after David dies, one of his descendants would build build a temple for God's name. And David's son Solomon would build a physical temple eventually, and there are some physical, other immediate physical ways in which God blessed David 
and Solomon and the people of Israel through them during their reigns, but none of that lasted forever. But despite that, we see that word forever and for all time show up in this promise multiple times. And it's not until Christ that we do find out the true long-term meaning of this covenant. So when Jesus came and he tabernacled among us, that's the, the literal world with the word, when he dwelt among us, he was a tabernacle, a living and moving temple, and he was capable of worshiping the Father wherever he went with every breath, and he was a beacon of, of light and of truth because he literally embodied the very presence of God in a human form. So Jesus is the king from the line of David, who is the ultimate fulfillment of this covenant. So he has secured the throne of God and his kingdom forever. And he's invited all of us to be a part of that kingdom. And thankfully, because he was able to take on the roles of both God and of humans, in all of, in, he was able to fulfill all of these covenants. And because of that, we're able to be restored into a relationship with God and partnership with God by trusting simply that Jesus did it for us because we, just like the Israelites couldn't, we can't do it for ourselves. So going back to 2 Samuel, we've, throughout the story we've seen several really good examples of how God exalts the humble and, and opposes the proud. And we can see him in all these stories moving his mission forward despite the mistakes that human make, and we'll see more of that also next week. But chapter 7 here is really just a gem to me because it connects this story of David to the story of the, the whole Bible. It builds on this pre-existing foundation of hope, and then it spells out this promise that has it's the, the foundation for so much to come. And then, so last week, because I gave Mike a, a challenge of sharing 12 things, which, by the way, I just put that in the bulletin without even telling him, so that's why he understandably wanted to pick on me a little bit for that. So he said I would have to share 30 things that I learned from the David Covenant, so I think he was kind of joking, but I came up with 30 anyway, so we're, we're going to go through all 30 right now. I'm, I'm just kidding. I have, I have three, though. <laughs> <coughs> So the first one is that God is and always has been faithful even when we are unfaithful to him. He is faithful to keep his promises. And we see that in 1 John 1, 1.9. It says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The second is that God wants to partner with humans to establish and to lead his kingdom. And these points could be whole sermons in themselves, so I'm just going to give you them really quickly with a couple references. So the fact that God wants to partner with humans, we see that in uh, 2 Corinthians 6.1 when Paul writes, As God, God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. It's a gift, but we're not meant to just be stagnant and ignore that gift. We are meant to be active participants in it. And then, finally, the third is that Jesus showed us what that kingdom actually looks like, and it's rather upside down, like we've talked about, uh, compared to man-made kingdoms. And we see that in the moment when, when Jesus was crucified, and a moment where most people would have considered to be the lowest and, and most humiliating experience you could have, that was the very means of his triumph over our enemies and his exaltation to the throne of God. And in a few minutes, we'll have an opportunity to, to reflect on that sacrifice and that gift and what it means to us as we participate as a family in the symbolic practice of communion. But before we do that, uh, I want to leave you with one more passage. And if you'd like to read along, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 55. If you want to just listen and, and meditate on it, that's fine as well. But this is an invitation in this chapter to share and, and join in the blessings of, of God's covenant with David. It, it speaks of the Davidic covenant specifically, and I'm, I'm just going to read the first five verses, but I would encourage 
any of you to kind of take some time this week in your quiet time to meditate on this whole chapter and even the chapters preceding it. In fact, all four of the covenants come up in these, in these few chapters here in Isaiah. Uh, but just read with me or, or listen to uh, Isaiah chapter 55 and just verses 1 through 5. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used him to display my power among the peoples. I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you do not know, and peoples unknown to you will come come running to obey, because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. So I just wanted to close with that thought, that idea that God is inviting you to join Him to participate in all of His infinite generosity. He wants to make you rich and glorious, but not after the the manner of kingdoms of men and materialism, but rather in simply the pleasure of knowing Him and in the power of the Spirit. Let's pray.